Hello, my friends. I would like to read a poem for you now. Life as a carbon is not that easy. To travel through stages effortlessly, dissolve we must into the sea to reach the plants and organisms underneath. With us, they can photosynthesize like all the other plants up there outside. Through this process, we transform into sugars to be stored. Someday, plants and animals would finally cease to live and provide. No longer they breathe. But our life as carbons will not yet end, for we got unfinished business to attend. Our old friends, fungi and bacteria, will break us down faster than ever. After that, it's back home to the sky, but we'll always be on standby. The cycle may never end, but for us, that's something that's hard to transcend. Thank you. I did not write this poem. I couldn't actually find out who did, but it's so relevant for our topic today, which is 4.3, all about the way that carbon cycles. If you forgot, carbon is essential for life and is one of the main nutrients. As a nutrient, it gets recycled within an ecosystem, but on a large scale, the earth itself helps to cycle carbon. The essential idea here is that continued availability of carbon in ecosystems depends on carbon cycling. Let's learn about the carbon cycle and the sinks and the fluxes. The biggest skill that you need to pick up is the ability to construct a diagram of the carbon cycle, labeling both the sinks and the fluxes. The carbon cycle is the biogeochemical cycle, and carbon gets exchanged between the four spheres of the earth, the atmosphere, lithosphere, which is the ground and bedrock, hydrosphere, which are the bodies of water, and the biosphere, which are the living organisms. Pools, or sinks, are reservoirs of carbon that have the capacity to take in and release carbon, and a flux is the movement or transfer of carbon from one pool to another. Carbon is exchanged between a variety of forms, including atmospheric gases in in carbon dioxide and in methane, oceanic carbonates, including bicarbonates dissolved in the water and calcium carbonate in corals and shells, as organic materials, including carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins that are found in all living things, and as non-living remains, such as detritus and fossil fuels. Here you can see the breakdown of terrestrial carbon and aquatic. Carbon is everywhere. In this last depiction of the carbon cycle, which is the one we're going to be using a lot in class, you can see the sinks, also known as pools, in white, while the fluxes are in yellow. As it states here, here, you need to know how to draw and label the sinks and fluxes of the carbon cycle. One sink is the carbon compounds in all producers. In addition to getting energy in an ecosystem, producers have a huge responsibility to attain carbon and cycle that into the ecosystem. Autotrophs, such as all plants and algae, convert inorganic carbon dioxide into organic compounds via photosynthesis, which you can see here. These organic compounds include the carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins required by the organism for survival. Just a reminder, Unless it's a chemoautotroph, producers use photosynthesis, taking carbon dioxide from the habitat and, along with water, converts that into glucose energy. So how do autotrophs get their CO2 into their systems? By the process of diffusion. Since autotrophs typically use carbon dioxide for photosynthesis, the levels of carbon dioxide within the organism should always be low. In other words, carbon dioxide should always be at a higher concentration in the atmosphere or water. This concentration gradient ensures that carbon dioxide will passively diffuse into the autotrophic organism as required. Diffusion is an important concept in biology and one we'll come across during cell biology and also human physiology. Organisms may produce chemical energy, also known as ATP, required to power metabolic processes via the process of cell respiration. This cell respiration involves the breakdown of organic molecules like sugars and produces carbon dioxide as a byproduct. You can see here in the image with this cute little bunny rabbit. Once again, diffusion comes to the rescue as the buildup of CO2 in respiring tissues creates a concentration gradient, allowing it to be removed by passive diffusion at the cellular level and then leaving the organism wherever gas exchange occurs. Even in autotrophs, cellular respiration occurs. Autotrophs use cellular respiration the same way as a heterotroph would to make macromolecules and power metabolic processes. In autotrophs, the uptake of CO2 by photosynthesis may at times be balanced by the production of CO2 by respiration. This is known as the compensation point, at which the net carbon dioxide assimilation is zero. That's where the intake equals the output. On a large scale, the amount of carbon dioxide in the environment will be determined by the level of these two processes. If there's more net photosynthesis than cell respiration occurring in the biosphere, atmospheric carbon dioxide levels should drop. If there's more net respiration than overall photosynthesis occurring, atmospheric carbon dioxide levels should increase. But these are not the only things to consider with regards to the carbon cycle. Let's go under the sea and check out aquatic systems and their
their interactions with carbon. Carbon dioxide dissolves in water, and some of it will remain as a dissolved gas. However, the remainder will combine with water to form carbonic acid, which is the CO2 plus H2O yields H2CO3. Carbonic acid will then dissociate or break up to form hydrogen carbonate ions. This conversion also releases hydrogen ions, which is why pH changes when CO2 is dissolved in water, and that means it becomes more acidic. The more CO2 dissolved, the more acidic a body of water will be. Bodies of water, so the hydrosphere, are a very large sink for carbon. Acidity has some implications that we're going to discuss later. One of the fluxes of carbon is the transfer in the hydrosphere from organisms and water into the sediment through the process of sedimentation. Hard-shelled organisms, like mollusks and corals, use carbon dioxide and water to ultimately make calcium carbonate, which is what the hard shells of these critters are made of. When the organism dies and settles to the seafloor, these hard components may become compacted and fossilized in limestone, which you can see in the picture. Additionally, when the hydrogen carbonate ions come into contact with the rocks and sediments on the ocean floor, they acquire metal ions and may form limestone as well as a precipitate. This is not as common as the biological method of forming limestone. Shifting slightly, let's talk about the transformation of dead organic material into methane. As we learned in topic 5, one of the domains we have are the archaea, and within that are the methanogenic archaea. These are found in more extreme conditions, in this case, where oxygen is scarce. When oxygen is scarce, we call it anaerobic. These methanogens produce methane from the byproducts of anaerobic digestion, principally acetic acid and carbon dioxide. This is how CO2 is involved and gets converted into methane. Anaerobic conditions can be found in swamps and wetlands, landfill sites, marine sediments, and ruminant stomachs like cows and sheep and goats. When methanogens make methane, it can be trapped underground as natural gas deposits or released into the atmosphere as a gas. So what happens to the methane, Mr. O? Does it just leave the carbon cycle? No dice, folks. When methane is released into the atmosphere, as a result of anaerobic reactions, it persists for roughly 12 years. Methane will be naturally oxidized to form carbon dioxide and water. Methane can also be combusted, and the same outcome will occur. This is why methane levels in the atmosphere are not very large, even though significant quantities are being produced. However, since the Industrial Revolution, human sources of methane emissions have been growing. Things like fossil fuel production, livestock farming, landfills and waste, biomass burning, biofuels, and then other natural sources of methane. So keep this in mind as we go into 4.4 and discuss climate change, because we'll later learn how methane is also a greenhouse gas. Great peak! Sometimes, when dead plants do not get fully decomposed due to acidic or anaerobic conditions, this brown soil-like substance called peat can form. This typically occurs in swamps, bogs, and wetland areas, and is composed of mosses, sedges, and shrubs, which are wetland-like plants. It typically forms at the rate of just one millimeter per year, which is pretty slow. Let's go through the formation of this stuff. First, lack of oxygen during decomposition causes anaerobic conditions. Anaerobic respiration by organisms produces organic acids, things like acetates, which result in acidic condition. Then, saprotrophic bacteria and fungi can't function effectively in these conditions, preventing decomposition. Peat is dead, partially decayed plants. It has carbon. Peat can be harvested, dried, and then burned. It's not at all renewable, though. If peat is left over millions of years, it will become coal. Here is a more in-depth flowchart for you visual learners about how peat is formed. Have a pause if you wish. Since the organic matter is not fully decomposed in waterlogged soils, carbon-rich molecules remain in the soil and form peat. When deposits of peat are compressed under sediments, the heat and pressure force out impurities and remove all of the moisture. The remaining material has high carbon concentration and undergoes a chemical transformation to produce coal. Similarly, oil and natural gas form as a result of the decay of marine organisms on the ocean floor. Sediments, things like clay and mud, are deposited on top of the organic matter, creating anoxic conditions, so without oxygen, that prevent decomposition. As a result of the burial and compaction, the organic material becomes heated and hydrocarbons are formed. The hydrocarbons form oil and gas, which are forced out of the source rock and accumulate in porous rocks, things like sandstone. The formation of fossil fuels, so coal, oil, and gas, takes place over millions and millions of years, making them a non-renewable energy source. Humans then use use these energy sources in daily processes. This has some pretty hefty implications as carbon is essentially locked and stored in the ground as these substances through fossilization and it is a sink. Until humans come along and unlock the carbon, sending it back into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide during the process of combustion. Yes, that's right. Us humans add to the chaos of a carbon cycle when we burn carbon. Don't get me wrong, combustion 
combustion happens naturally as well. So what is combustion? Well, combustion is a chemical process in which the substance reacts rapidly with oxygen and gives off heat. You can see the chemical formula given here. The reactants, which if you recall from physical science, are on the left side and consist of the fuel source along with oxygen. In the presence of energy, it will burn. The products on the right side are carbon dioxide and water. In terms of the sources, you can input any fuel. We can break those sources into fossilized fuels, things like peat, coal, oil, and natural gas, and also biomass, which are things like biodiesel, bioethanol, and just things that are not fossilized but contain carbon, like trees. So something like forest fires can also be combustion. In short, combustion is one of the fluxes of the carbon cycle, transferring carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. Do we know exactly how much of this carbon sits in the sinks and how much gets moved in the fluxes? The short answer is not exactly, but we can generally estimate, but not really specifically. Estimating carbon fluxes requires an understanding of the factors that can affect the exchange of carbon between the different sinks. Some of the main causes for flux change include climate conditions, natural events, and human activity. For example, with regards to the climate conditions, the rates of photosynthesis will likely be higher in the summer seasons as there's more direct sunlight and longer days. This will take more CO2 out of the atmosphere. Oceanic temperatures also determine how much carbon is stored as dissolved carbon dioxide or as hydrogen bicarbonate ions. Additionally, climate events like El Nino and La Nina will change the rate of carbon flux between ocean and atmosphere, and melting of polar ice caps will result in the decomposition of frozen detritus. Natural events like forest fires can release high levels of carbon dioxide when plants burn, and the loss of trees also reduces photosynthetic carbon uptake, and volcanic eruptions can release carbon compounds from the Earth's crust into the atmosphere. Lastly, human activities like clearing trees for agricultural purposes will reduce the removal of atmospheric CO2 via photosynthesis. Increased numbers of ruminant livestock will produce higher levels of methane, and the burning of fossil fuels will release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. There are two key takeaways from this slide. The first is to know the seven fluxes. There are cell respiration, photosynthesis, combustion, incomplete fossilization, feeding, death, and excretion. The other key is to know the unit of measure for carbon values. This is gigatons of carbon per year. Did you know that a giga is derived from the Greek word for giant and stands for one billion? So yeah, a gigaton is one billion tons. Lastly, you must be able to explain the annual fluctuation in atmospheric carbon dioxide in the Northern Hemisphere. Atmospheric CO2 concentrations have been measured at the Mauna Loa Observatory, which is in Hawaii, since 1958 by Charles Keeling. This is a lot of data, and from these continuous and regular measurements, a clear pattern of carbon flux can be seen. First, CO2 levels fluctuate annually. That means every year. So it's lower in the summer months when long days and more light increase photosynthetic rates and draw more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Global CO2 trends will conform to northern hemisphere patterns as it contains more of the planet's land mass, which will have more trees. Carbon dioxide levels are steadily increasing year on year since the Industrial Revolution due to the increased burning of fossil fuels. Atmospheric CO2 levels are currently at the highest levels recorded since measurements began. That's all I got. Hope you learned a few things about the carbon cycle and stay fresh. As always, it's really important to give credit where it's due. While the presentation script and video are solely of my own creation, many of the images and information contained in the presentation are not. So shout outs to the following. Most of the images and video clips come from IB Bio Ninja and some of the information used. Other images and info came from Bionology, iBiology, Biology for Life. Lastly, some information was gleaned from the Cambridge edition of the IB Biology text as the intended purpose of this presentation is to provide you with yet another resource tool to enhance your learning for the IV Biology curriculum. So peace out.